there. You know, the ones who are risk takers, the ones who are a little wilder, the ones who are extroverted enough that you're always noticing them wherever you go, right? The ones that are just kind of in your face. In my experience, they're the first ones who step up when there's trouble. And your child might have trouble someday. Um, I'll give you an example that's very bigger bigger than other examples might be with younger children. But when we took our son, our first son to college at KU, um, he was going to play football, so he was in the football dorm. And we went into the room where they, they was going to have three roommates. And so there were um, two inner city kids, and then there was my son, and then there was a kid from St. Louis who had gone to a private independent school and looked a lot like my son. So there were these, these kids were in two different ex life experience pieces. The one, uh, that their prom pictures, they each had brought prom pictures, and the two from the inner city schools, Detroit and uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they were all in their tuxedos. They were flashing gang signs, and they were doing all this stuff that looked kind of scary. And then there's these, my son and the kid from St. Louis, and they were kind of, you know, looking their muscles and, so it looked the same, but it didn't look the same. You know, it was one of those things, is, is this okay? We just, you don't, I don't know, is this okay? Well, the one kid from Detroit was named Bonnie. He was an All-American. He was the highest level recruit KU had ever had in football. He never played it down uh, because he never, he never got his grades up and was eligible to play. But Bonnie was a scary-looking guy. I mean, he was 6'6". Six, six. He, he had to weigh 380 pounds. I mean, he was huge. And he was carrying Katie around. She was a little girl. And I'm leaving thinking, okay, <laughs> see you later, honey. Um, Hamilton called us the first week of school. Bonnie's girlfriend had come to visit from Detroit, and she was pregnant. He had three children with other girls. But this girl, she wasn't pregnant. She just had a baby. She brought the baby to show Bonnie. They were there a week. And to celebrate, Bonnie had had taken a hot hanger and, and burned into his arm the name of the child. While they were sitting there on the couch, you know, everybody was together. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, if I should let him live here. I mean, this just is, it was just way, way bigger. So time goes by, and, and we get worried about Hamilton. We're not hearing from him. Things, you know, we're just nervous that things aren't going well for him, not about his roommates. And there were no, we didn't have cell phone. And if he didn't answer the phone at the apartment, he, we didn't know. And we weren't quite sure what to, who to contact or what to think. So finally, uh, my husband kept calling the room. And finally, one day, Bonnie answers the phone. And Pat says, you know, Bonnie, I, I, we're just worried about Hamilton. Why are you worried about Hamilton? He said, well, we haven't heard from him. And we, last time we talked to him, we really seemed down and upset about some things. And Bonnie said, oh, Mr. Hill, don't you know I've got his back? <laughs> and he did. I mean, he did. It, they, they were roommates. They were, they were friends. They became. They became what you become when you're in these situations where you're together. And, and you never know who those people are going to be as a parent. And you know your child may be isolated sometimes. And you know your child may be mistreated sometimes, but what you don't know is who might be the one to turn that around or to stand up for them. Or who might be the only one willing to be the friend. So it may not be the friend you would choose, but it's better than no friend. It's you always need a friend. You know, you always need someone to walk through with. You don't need bunches, but you need one. You need one. So it's, it's, it's just how we just have to be careful about that and to know that the chemistry of friendship isn't something that parents really have much control over. You do have control over proximity of people, but you don't have much control over. There are studies they've done with 18-month-olds in daycare. And within just a few days, you see them gravitating to a particular other child. They form a relationship that they are like almost like there's a little magnet, you know, pulling them to that person. Who knows why? Who knows why we get pulled to the people that we get pulled to? Anything else on there look in like, like it would be of any help?
Um, so there, somewhere in the notes, maybe or maybe not, there's this phrase. If a child can do it, they should do it. If the child can do it with a little help, then you should give a little help. So then we have to decide, is it just that we think they can't? Uh, and we don't want to let go of that, you know, the, the possibility of being needed, or can they do it? And if they can do it, they should do it. The thing with 16-year-olds is most of the problems they have, um, or many of the problems they have, certainly with friendships at school, with relationships with teachers, with um, problems with all kinds of things, coaches, with, with all kinds of things, are problems that actually only they can solve. So the, sort of the advice and consent, we might be able to give advice, but it's always better to ask first, what are you going to do about it? If they've shared with you the problem or if you found out about it and brought it to them, even, you know, 12-year-old girls, every time I go to my locker, Sally slams it in my face and everybody laughs. And that, even in that situation, when the first response from you is, what are you going to do about it? Nine times out of ten, Sally will say, don't worry, Mom, I know what I'm going to do about it. Or this is what I'm going to do about it. They, they, they know. They know better than we know what, what these kids are going to take, how you're going to be able to do it without losing face, how you're going to be able to stand, you know, what to do about it. If they say, I have no idea, I need help, then you definitely know when to stand in. If their safety, if their physical safety or their emotional safety is clearly in danger, you might need to get help. Um, if it's a problem they can't solve, they got a, they were driving, they got a ticket, and they don't have $150 to pay it. Um, uh, you know, if it's a problem that they had a wreck and they don't know how to get the car fixed, or a problem they don't know how to solve and they're willing, then they need your help, then you're going to have to help. But what you're hoping for is problems that don't need you. You want them to practice. And you don't even probably, I mean, ideally, we don't even care if they m mess it up a little bit while they're trying to solve it. That's where the lesson comes. Um, I, I do think that if you weren't in the iGen class, I do think that there's, a, uh, there's this layer of difference when you get to public humiliation or shaming from things that end up online or the things that go viral or things that the public, you know, that go where they shouldn't go, public, where they, they really may need you to step in and say, Here's, uh, we're getting help with this right now. Um, we had some friends, this is, this is long ago, but I, it was very important for me as a parent to hear these parents talk about this. Um, they had a high school daughter who got pregnant. And the daughter and the boyfriend came to the parents and said, you know, we're pregnant. So I'm just, when, he, when we're hearing this story, I'm just horrified. I mean, I just don't even know what in the world they're going to do and what the story was, the story is going to go. So the, the parents telling us the story said, so the dad just stood right. They, they, the kids told the parents what was going on. The dad stood up and went to the phone and called the priest, their priest, they were Catholic, and turned back to the group and said, this is something we need help with. We need help to figure out what we're going to do next. What we know we're not going to do next is make another mistake next. You know, we, we're not going to make a decision that becomes another mistake. Um, this couple ended up not marrying. They, the girl ended up having the baby, and they did not marry. Four years later, they did get married. But the, the, the stepping up and saying, okay, we, it, we do have a situation and we do need help is a um, profound thing for, young, for adolescents to hear. And to hear, we're not going to make mistake two and three next. You know, we're going we're gonna to make this work, right? Well, I, I, 
one of the things that happens with teenagers is um, they, they may become, especially boys, but they may become less uh, talking to you. They may talk to you less about things as the things become um, things they wouldn't talk to mom and dad about. You know, they may, they, they may, and then what happens is they get kind of out of the habit of sharing and confiding in you and all, and all that and get tired of answering all the questions. What happened at school today? What did you do? Why are you late? But the magical thing is that when they're in bed at night and the lights go out and you're talking, all of a sudden it feels more like it's always been they're talking. And in that kind of intimate and quiet moment, there, there, this, this openness comes that, that isn't there in the, in the light of day. Um, teenage girls may tell their mothers everything or they may tell their mothers everything until there's something they don't want them to know. But teenage boys don't share as much. I, I had a friend once who said, all of us who have boys ought to have the mothers with girls write a newsletter and let the rest of us know what's going on. And uh, that was kind of true, but, I, but our boys talk to us at, at night. It's sort of like in the car when, you're, when your younger kids will say things in front of you in the car that wouldn't just come up when you're asking them questions. But with teenagers, it's more of a... They're more vulnerable and open. At the end. And I do think they're not going to want you to hug them and kiss them and say their prayers and read them books and all that. But I do think there's something reassuring to them and that helps them sleep better to know that you want them safe in their beds and tucked in and that you're going to check on them and tell them you love them. It's, it, it should not stop uh, just because they want their privacy and they become older and <laughs> I'm probably not going to be that house. Um, and so I feel a little guilty about that, but then I also want to try and find out who that house is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Where is this house? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to assume, Kathy, I don't know if this is true, but I'm going to assume this is true. So I wasn't at home making that house either, but we all got home at the same time. Because even though I wasn't home, they were here too, going to sports or kids club. or I mean, we, we got in the car and came home, right? Or later on after there were all the practice and things, at some point in the night, everybody was at home, right? So I guess I think it, one possibility is that that's when you notice that. And it doesn't have to be the fresh baked cookies. It just means when they come home from school and they're starving or in the middle of the, you know, they're still eating. I mean, my kids would go through a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk a day in those teenage years. It's hard to keep all that together. But when they're still eating ham sandwiches at 10 o'clock at night and they've had the sixth or seventh one, if you still got ham and bread, you're that house. It's if they're still craving something and there's nothing there, that they're feeling the uh, a coldness of it. It doesn't even have to be food, but I mean just the, yeah, it, it would be nice for all of us who work to have our wife at home getting all the rest of this stuff done. But all that really needs to happen is when we all are home, that stuff feels like it's there for us. Like, Well, it could be for reasons you don't want them to go to that house. Well, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it would be 
nice, but I think it's just more of, it's sort of that, that feeling of abundance. Uh, abundance doesn't mean that it has to be extravagance or a, even affluence or anything like it. It just means that when we're all here together, we all have what we need. We've got the fire. We've got the marshmallows. We're all around it. You know, we're, we're feeling it. It's more a way of feeling than it is even of doing. But that does draw people in. They aren't coming if you don't have stuff to eat and drink and, you know, a video game to play and a, and a screen. And you won't collect any kind of crowd. Otherwise, yeah, but it is kind of a magical thing. That's a comment on the question. Mm-hmm. My comment is just speaking of parenting tips, and I just love to hear other people's experiences. So I'm just going to share one of my things that I learned was um, so our teenage daughter came home one day, and you know they have a lot of hormones going on, so there are a lot of days where emotions are high and low. And but on that particular day, I just happened to ask her, did something happen at school? And instead of, like, getting on her face for being in a bad mood and taking it out on the people that she loves, um, I asked her that, and come to find out, she had a really rotten day. And so it saved, you know, I feel like it was a little salvage the relationship for the day and kind of just taught me something about, you know, in the future, you know. Chat. They don't, because they don't always just come home and tell you um, this and this and that happened, and it comes out in different ways, so. They can come to us and that's the older, That it just comes out. And I told her, you know, I can understand your behavior when I know the, the driving force behind it, you know. Just because you have CMS doesn't give you the right to treat everyone else poorly. So we have to learn to regulate and manage our hormones and stuff, but people are a lot more understanding of you and your, you know, your attitude or your emotions or whatever, we may know what's going on. Well, and so much of it has to do with the way we handle those things. I mean, I can even slam my hand in the cupboard and scream out and have someone yell, what's wrong, and say, nothing. You know, well, something's a little wrong. I mean, I just about cut off my fingers. Um, but I, I certainly do it in other ways, too. I can be really aggravated at somebody in my house. Um, and if they ask, I can say, no, I'm fine. No, what do you mean? Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. And you can say that enough hundreds of times to your kids for them to learn to say it, too. Nothing's wrong. You know, nothing's wrong. Every, oh, why do you say that? Everything's just fine, you know? So to talk about feelings and to talk about what's behind the things that are going on with us is something that is is very much learned behavior, and it's difficult to learn it. Self-regulation and and self-disclosure. These are things that that are hard to learn. When we tell a two-year-old who's having a fit to take a deep breath and count to four, that's still hard when we're 20, right? Take a deep breath and count to four. That's hard. It's hard to do that. What we're always trying to do as a parent, whether we know it or not, so we are the locus of control for our little children. We are the ones who get them through their fits and who calm them down when something happens and who get them to sleep when they're aroused. aroused and who, We're the ones who are pressing in from the outside, helping them calm and soothe and all these things. Right? We're always hoping that there will be self-soothing. That they'll wake up in the middle of the night and they'll self-soothe themselves back to sleep, right? But the goal is, and this is these, these years, this, this, this is this time. The goal is for them to have an interior, an inside, a, a within them, um, locus of control where they can control their anger, they can control their sadness, they can control their anxiety, they can control their disappointment, all of the bad feelings that can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow if they're not controlled can be calmed away. That's what adults do all the time. 
or we wouldn't keep our jobs and keep our marriages and keep our friends. And we spend, we learn how to do that. That's what they're trying to learn how to do. That's one of what of the most important things happening here. Is the, this so? When the, when the daughter comes home upset and you didn't do anything to make her upset, so there's a reason she's upset, and you're able to say, did something happen today? And she's able to talk about it. That means that she's realizing that when she talks about it, it's going to feel better. And when she keeps it in, it's not. It's going to grow. It's going to get out and feel better, or it's going to stay in and grow. That's what's going to happen. So when, we, when we're working on this, teaching kids to self-disclose and self-regulate, and, uh, and we have to model it, and we have to help that happen. It's difficult. Um, it's very, very difficult. And it grows into more of a problem right now with this generation than it has been. So it's important and difficult. Yes, we hope so. Mm-hmm. Uh, what will complicate it, of course, will be there will be things that they won't want to talk to mom about that make them feel bad, even though it would probably make them feel better. They're worried. You know, I mean, there, there are things that they do they don't think moms know about. There are definitely things they think that they don't think parents think about or did when they were that age. So th- there are a lot of things that become that I would never talk to my mom about. But, I, but, but they always know mom cares how they feel. So that's where the question at the right time that Aaron's talking about is the possibility for opening that up. I'll, um, if I ever make a mistake with Kathleen, I say if ever, um, <laughs> I found that the best thing I do with her, I used to teach middle school, and I, if I could ever admit to the students, I made a mistake. This was, it really resonated with them. So I've always tried to do that with Kathleen. And the thing that I've started doing with her now is I say to her, it's mom's first time being a parent to a 10 year old. And that really makes it like we're a team. Mm-hmm. And I find that, that she kind of, huh, you know, and I think it, it I, we talk about, you know, puberty's coming and how we'll get through this together. Mm-hmm. We'll do it together. And I, that really resonates with her because it's just a, uh, because that's she, right. Oh, she hears it's self disclosure. I mean, Mm-hmm. I, I know I made a mistake, honey. It's my first time. It's your first time being 10. It's my first time being a parent to a 10-year-old. And I just, I find that help. Just really, I admit to her, I don't know everything. I don't know everything, and I don't know everything about what you're going through. And that seems to help. Well, it's so authentic. It's, so, it's so real. Oh, her little face just, just relaxes. And she's, you know, you can see it. I think you're 100% right. I also, I mean, they, they want to think that someone's in charge and someone knows what they're doing, but they also just saw you mess up. I mean, whoever sees you mess up more than your kids? <laughs> nobody. There's nobody who will ever see you mess up as much as your kids will. I've found with teenagers all the time that they've got a lot they want to say, but you've got to ask the question. And the question isn't, how was your day? Right? You've got to ask the right question. Um, and then they've got things to say, and one of the right questions might be, "Okay, I, you know, I, I, I'm sorry this happened. In the future, what would you, what would be better? How could we get through this more easily? What would, what could I have done that would have helped you sooner, or whatever?" And and I, it's like those students writing me a letter. You know, I think they could, they can tell us things. They might not. I mean, if they say, "Well, I don't think you should have any. I shouldn't have to do chores. Or you sh- I shouldn't have to be punished if I get a." stick it in the car or something. That's not really up for grabs, but there's, it's a relationship. There, there's ways to learn to give and take and listen to each other in that relationship. That teaches them how to have relationships with other people. And we aren't born with that, we're born with that desire, but we're not born with expertise. I do think we're, we're born with the connection desire. Anything else here that... <coughs> Okay, I found the, um, let me see if there's any, I think I can't let you not hear me say. 
Well, that's that. That's an old-fashioned expression. My dad was a college president, and um, my dad was an interesting person. He was a coal miner, and 15 years later, he was a college president. But um, he used to always say when the college students would be, you know, marching or burning down buildings or, you know, doing weird things, he would always say, they're kids. Kids do things. They're kids. Uh, but he also would talk about climbing Fool's Hill. And climbing Fool's Hill is where you learn things. Be making mistakes. Go in the wrong direction. Or no direction at all. Then doing the things that kids do. This is, when do you want to do it? You're going to have some adventures. You're going to have some exploration. You're going to have some discovery process. You're going to test the waters. If you don't do it when you're a teenager... When's the right time to do it? And you don't want to do it when you're 40 years old and you have a family who's depending on you. It's better to do it when you're a kid. Climb a few of those hills. And um, that's what it means. Let them have mis make mistakes and have some adventures. Adventures. Um, okay, I found the poem that I wanted to, first of all, I wanted to tell you, and I love this. And it sort of applies, but we were talking about um, you knowing your children, but them having to learn to know themselves. Um, so th there's this little poem by Eileen Fisher, and it is, When I grow up, as everyone does, what will become of the me I was? The me I was is you. <laughs> But wouldn't we all like to see ourselves as a young person and know what people thought or know what, what... Wouldn't we love to go back? And there are people who know who you were. Your teachers who had you, your third grade teachers, know who you were then. In fact, when they see you today and they look at you today, what they're thinking is third grade you, right? They, because that's when they had a relationship with you. That's when they watched you every day. That's when they saw you with your friends and with your tasks and your challenges and your parents. And so there are people around who knew the you that was, and certainly your parents can always talk about it when you're grown. But the fun thing is to begin to feel the power of who you were it, that is still there. And that's self-actualization. That's, that's what happens to us as human beings. We, we hope. We all actualize. What's nice to know is whatever are these strengths, talents, whatever this stuff comes from, it came from that seed that was there. That was always. That was always there. We hope it blooms. You know, we hope it comes to fruition. Um, if you've seen the, um, the movie, the Fred Rogers movie, Who Will Be My Neighbor? Well, the rest of you have got to go home and watch it. Who Will Be My Neighbor is a documentary. It's now on demand, so I'm guessing you can get it in Redbox and other places too. It is the most amazing movie for parents to watch. My kids did not watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood because we weren't home during the day. And I certainly wasn't watching TV, so they missed that. My children watch Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is the cartoon version of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So if your little kids ever watched that, that's what it is. It's a very um, kind, gentle exploration of how to grow up, what it means to be human and how to grow up. But the, the documentary is so philosophically deep, so wise, so warm, that it just takes your breath away. But there are two parts of it that I want to share with you before we charge forward. The first part came when they, they showed a snippet of a graduation speech to, that he gave at some college. And he was, he was speaking to these college graduates as if they knew him from the show, and they, they probably did. They were of the age where that would have been true. And in, he, he ends the speech by saying, there's only one thing that ever changes the world, and that thing is love. And he says, 
Each of us have been beneficiaries of love at some point in our lives, and it has been that love that we've been get granted that has changed us as human beings. And then he said, from the time, this is a quote, from the time you were very little, you've had people who have smiled you into smiling, talked you into talking, sung you into singing, loved you into loving. Some may be right here, some may be far away. Some may even have died. No matter where they are, deep down you know that you've always wanted, they've always wanted what's best for you. They've always cared for you beyond measure and have encouraged you to be the best within you. So I think as parents, what resonates about his whole message, but this in particular, is the way he put that together. Though so who's the one who smiled you into smiling? I mean, who did you smile into smiling? Who talked you into talking? Who loved you into loving? And that's what parents do. And that's what children take with them. They don't take with them the day you screamed at them for bringing mud in the house. I mean, they don't. They, it, it is this love, this, this peace that is what we have that is so important. Um, after his show ended, it wasn't that long later, but 9-11 happened, and um, the producers of, of uh, the station where his show had come from wanted him to do a special for children uh, about 9-11. And so he came on, and this is in the, in the film, and he talked to them about this scary thing that had happened and this bad thing that had happened and he offered these words of comfort. No matter what our particular job, especially in our world today, we are called on to be tikkun olam, repairers of creation. That's a, a Jewish phrase. Thank you for whatever you do, wherever you are, to bring joy and light and hope and faith and pardon and love to your neighbor and to yourself. Uh, he also told him in that show, when bad things happen, look around, and you will always see people helping. And those helpers that you see are what you should focus on. Those are the repairs of creation. This will always happen. There will always be times when we need helpers. Um, so this kind of profound wisdom is very lacking in, in the media. It, it's not a, it's, these aren't lessons children get every time they turn on a screen. Right. So it's, I think that's why this, this documentary made such a splash this summer is because it was just so obviously true, so obviously good, and one made you wonder, what's wrong with us? That our children aren't surrounded by this kind of, um, of optimism and hope in spite of the trouble that, that we have around us. So I, I encourage you, I encourage you to, maybe tonight, watch that, that video, that film. Eileen Fisher. Surely not. You know, it, it is spelled that way, uh, but I don't think so. So this one came out of a collection of her most popular poems called Always Wondering. Uh, but I think it, you could find it probably in any collection of her poetry. And she's got all these very sweet poems like that. But I love that one. That one speaks to my heart because I think the whole who am I is the whole thing about growing up. Um, you know, it's the parents answered it. Now I have to answer it. And then the world will know that thing. Uh, after you answer the question, who am I? The next question is, whose am I? This is profound because that's a spiritual question. And the next question is, and what is my place in the world? Because, you know, if you want to, if you say it wouldn't matter to my family if I'm not there, think about the next step, which is, does it even matter to the world if I'm not here? You need a place in the world. Okay, let's come back to, we were talking about the... Um, the relationships that are rich and diverse. 
And I would like you to take a few minutes to jot down for you who some of those relationships were that, that added, you know, color to your prism, that, that added uh, experience to, uh, to you about what humanness was. And then maybe jot down who you suspect might be those people for your children. Or if they don't have those people, is there anything about the way you're parenting that is keeping that close so that it's not happening? Did you think of some people in your life? Uh, did you think of some people in your children's lives? And do you have any um, uh, helpful observations for us about how you might allow that to happen or, or orchestrate that? Or Any thoughts about that? I found that too when I was teaching that it seemed like kids who who were who, who went to camp in the summer always came back so much more grown up and confident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they do all sorts of stuff, though. I mean, they... 
Do your kids go there too? No, they don't. They actually look at doing that. They have not gone yet, but I'm thinking like what I did when I was in the That, that's that high standards, high nurture, yeah. and you don't have to get it from a parent, right? That's right. And, but you can also you can mentor your own kids. You know what I mean? They need to see that they need that type of person or persons that can be more than one in their life. Whether it's a parent, uh, aunt or uncle or grandparent. Or, you know, grandparents are excellent mentors. You know, they have all the experience.
Yeah, that's how it happens, right? That, that's where that the, you get those other strands that come in and help you weave that life. Um, those of you who've never sent your kids to camp or are interested, there really are a lot of wonderful camps of all different kinds in different places in the world. And um, a lot of families do grandma camp, <laughs> which is a much kinder, gentler way of thinking about sending your kids away. But I, I do think, I mean, of course things can happen anywhere, but I do think that kids who go to camp seem to really get a lot uh, from it. And it's that elongated experience that makes it a little more powerful than an activity that they might be getting at, at home, I think. Well, probably the people at the camps are the best ones to answer that. But I mean, who said there's left at age six? Okay. And but that would be for a week? That was two weeks for seven-year-olds? So I, I thought there were some Canica weeks that were just one. So, so sometimes you could start with like a few days or a week camp. And if it goes well and it seems like that is something that resonates, then you can move up. Some will be as long as eight weeks, but two, two weeks to a month. or You kind of have to do that gradually, I think, to decide what you think. Embrace it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that idea of planting seeds is really good. And any experience is brand new for a child. Most kids are going to be a little hesitant about something they've never done, especially if they've never done it and they're not going with anybody that they know. So you have to prepare for the situation and prepare the child for the situation. And, um, and it's, you know, it really isn't for everybody. I was always sent to camp, and I was not one of those people who loved it. Um, because they really didn't let me sit around and read all day. <laughs> but I still made lots of wonderful friends and grew from it. So it you know, really just depends so much on the camp and the kids and what the experience is. Can we, can we start a camp for us? No. <laughs> no, that, that would mean I'd have to be there. <laughs> Actually, go online. There are books of there are books that list every camp and what they do, what ages, and places to contact for um, feedback. I mean, I'm sure it's online too. Um, some people in Wichita used to send their kids up to uh, Camp Lake Hubert. Yeah, uh, and there, that might have been a girls' camp, and there was a boys' camp too. Yeah, and was that a good camp? Stanford Foundation sponsored these camps there, and they were um, leadership training of some kind, but beautiful setting, really well-run camp, and they did so many books on it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was the idea of sending me. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, how do we, you know, this whole idea of habits of mind, and how you know, it takes a while to form a habit, but once you do, then it sets you on a path that you, you're never off. Once you get certain habits ingrained, it's hard to get rid of them. One of the problems we have is kids make lots of bad habits, habits of mind. You know, if you're spending six hours on social media a day, um, and it's addictive, and you're doing it, that is a habit of mind that is hard to break. You just try doing it. You just don't plug for a day and see. And, it, and, and you're not in fear of having no friends if you don't do it. So um, so the, the trick for parents is to figure out, okay, what are the things that we can get them doing that are forming habits that are the kind of habit that propel them to success, that propel them to friendship, that propel them to um, the future in, in good <coughs> and good ways. So we've, we've already talked about some of them. Some of them would be things like, 
doing chores and really being an integral part of what's happening in your family, taking care of your family, taking care of each other. Uh, but there are things that can happen at home uh, that create these habits. And you are like the, it's like, uh, like a teacher making a lesson plan. The parent becomes the one who's planning this, thinking this out. I mean, when you're going to think it out is right now, say. You don't have to think it out every minute, but just when you think it out. Uh, one thing that, that most parents are excellent at because it's one of the first jobs they have with their child, and that is managing how you do bedtime. Um, you know, if you, if you figure out when you can't get your little one to sleep, that it really helps to have a routine where you give them a bath and you know, give them a bottle, give them a bath, read them a book, put them in bed. And you do that every night, and so when that when those things start to happen, they start to yawn, and by the time you pop them in bed, they go to sleep. You know, if you if you've done that successfully, and you've done it successfully every time they've graduated into a new part of childhood, then you probably have this concept well in mind that there definitely are rituals around bedtime that lead to lifetime habits of being able to sleep and being productive when you wake up. And not being, and not worrying when you sleep. Now I've thought a lot about how much teenagers worry in bed at night. How little they, how hard they find it to fall asleep. Gosh, I their cell phones are in there, which they should know. Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering, I'm just wondering this, but when, uh, when, I, uh, when I was growing up and with my kids, the last thing we would do besides the the reading and the singing and you know, the things that stretched out forever was we'd say our prayers. And at the end of the prayer, it was God bless Mommy and Daddy and Aunt Susie and whoever, whoever was on their minds that day. I am wondering if, if that alleviated some of the worry that kids go through at night. The having said, uh, whatever, you know, whatever was said in a, in a prayer or in a good night thing, but also the, not me, God bless you and you and you, I'm not saying me, I'm thinking about you and you and you, God watch over you. I wear this, um, these necklaces, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wear these two necklaces. I've been wearing them for a long time now. This one was my mother's, and it is a cherub. And this one was my mother-in-law. Uh, after they both died, it, I mean, talk about a passage in life. The passage when your parents are gone. That's a hard one. And, um, and after they both died, I had these two pieces of jewelry, which I didn't have before because they had them. And for years, I never took them off. Uh, because I just, I don't know. I mean, I know they're just, it's just, it's just a hunk of stuff, but... I just felt like they were there. Then, for a while, I wasn't wearing them. I don't know. I forgot to put them on one day, and that was that habit. But then I started having these grandbabies, and what I noticed right away was whoever I was holding would play with them. Mm -hmm. And when kids used to play with my earrings, my kids used to play with my earrings, and it, and it hurt, and I you know, didn't want But this was a whole different thing. And then when they got a little older, and they would play with it, and they would say, what is that? And then I said, well, you know, that's, that's it. And Packy's angel. They, my kids called my mother Packy. That's Packy's angel. And she's watching over us. Then pretty soon, they would say, who's Packy? And then I'm telling stories about my mother. What's this? What's this other one? Well, that's, that was Grandma Evelyn's. Who's Evelyn? You know, and now I'm telling stories about Evelyn. There is just... I don't know, but I think the one thing we're missing with our kids is this spiritual thread. I'm not saying if it's, there's not a spiritual thread in your life, that that's, that you need to all of a sudden decide, okay, I'll get one. Because that's not how it works. But I think if there is a spiritual thread, that one of the things we've left out of childhood is a sense of peace. That it, no matter what happens, somewhere in the overall scheme of the way the world is put together, it's going to be okay. It doesn't feel good today, for sure, but it, it's going to be. I think children need something to alleviate this 
anxiety that is just running rampant. I don't <coughs> think all of us would have the same answer for what that is. But it's it's something to think about when we think about routines that build habits that lead to productive life. I am a big fan of homework. I know that there is nothing more frustrating than going home after a day of work, a day of school with tired kids and laundry and meals and, and practices and all these other things than to make them sit down and do their homework. I know that. I have three kids. They weren't the most compliant children in America. <laughs> but this habit of, first of all, there's good reason that, uh, that there are some things that you shouldn't waste your dollars and time doing in a classroom with other people when you can read your book at home. So there's some things you have to do alone, but this habit of, I have this work to do, here's my list, I've got to get it done, I've got to get it here, I've got to get in the bag, it's got to be in my locker, I've got to take it to the right class, and and then we can figure out what I learned from it and what I did, what I did wrong. It's the, it's the little organization thing. You go home, I'm assuming, if you, if you work outside the home, if you work inside the home, this is true too. If you go home, you probably have work you bring with you in the briefcase or on the telephone or in the call that happens. You've probably got a list of things you've got to do at home and for your family and for the church and for the business. So your kids see you doing things. Children like to mimic parent behavior because it's an adult learning test. So I see homework as another one of those habits. I figured it out. I kept it organized. I got it done. Boom. That's that. Now, what do I do? A habit that leads to a productive life uh, and to a life of achievement. Um, I think another habit we teach, and it's so interesting that you buy books now that teach you how to do this, because to me it seems like it's very much ingrained in family life, is the habit of thankfulness. Is understanding that we have much to be grateful for, and it's important to say so. It's important to claim it, just like we claim our gifts. We, um, and so that's where that may be that God bless or God thank you, but it doesn't have to be in that form. It can be we go around the table while we're eating dinner, and what, what are we thankful for? It can be a Thanksgiving as we look back over the year. What what happened in our life as a family that we're thankful for? We do that one year. At, one year at Thanksgiving, we were going around the table, and one of my sons had um, had an operation uh, with a broken arm, and um, he really loved the morphine. So when we went around the table that year, he was really thankful for that morphine. But it's not always profound. Doing that. It is an activity that requires you reflection and requires um, a notice of it, saying so. And then if you really want to take the next step, it's for them to learn to tell that person, to write that note, to make that call, to uh, send an email, to claim you, what you said yesterday changed my life. Or, or when you stepped up to help me, I'll never forget it. I'm so grateful for that. Or uh, with the teacher, you know, I, I never leave this class without having learned something. Thank you. Or from our child, when you made me laugh today, you'll never know how much that mattered because I was so sad. And you cheered me up. I'm so grateful for you. That habit of thankfulness, if we look at the qualities that make people successful in every field, it is the way they connect to other people. And thankfulness and gratitude has to be part of that. If we figure out in these happiness studies what makes people happy, these are people who understand gratitude. Happiness always comes from looking out there. It doesn't come from dwelling in here. It comes from looking out there. And that's what, what we, our kids are very self-centered. We're, we're always trying to help them look the other way. Look at what the family is thinking. Look at what the friends are thinking. That's that. Um, habits of things like gift giving. I mean, you, you probably celebrate occasions where gifts are given, whether they're birthdays or Christmas or other kinds of holidays. Um, but it's the children's gifts that they're learning from is what they're giving to other people. It's what they thought about that uh, about giving. At some point, I decided that I was going to quit buying presents for Hamilton to give to Harrison or for Katie to give to Grandma. 
if they wanted to give presents, they were going to go out and buy them themselves. Because I was already giving these people presents. So we did their presents. So on this particular brainstorm of the morning, uh, we lived in a neighborhood without any stores, but there was about four blocks away, there was a 7 Eleven. So I decided that my oldest son was was big enough to go to 7 Eleven and buy presents. And I gave him some money. He might have been seven or eight. And it, it was a stretch whether he really should have done this or not. It wasn't <laughs> a great movie. But anyway, he took the dog with him. They walked <laughs> along the river, they went to 7 Eleven. He came back with sacks. I could not wait for Christmas. I mean, I just could not even imagine <laughs> what he would have bought at 7-Eleven that would be a gift. <laughs> we had a house that had a one-car garage, and I had turned that into a laundry room. So the cars were always outside. So every morning when we went to school in the winter, we spent the first part of the morning, you know, getting the ice off the windows. So my present was when I opened it. It was a very strange box, and it was a, a can of stuff you spray on the windshield to get rid of the ice, mm -hmm. and a long-handled ice scraper, which was definitely a step up from the one that I'd been using. <laughs> I thought it was the best gift I'd ever been given, because it meant that he was looking around what was something that mom could use. Oh my goodness! The perfect gift, right here it is, right? So from then on, my kids were in charge of their own gifts. Now, I will say, the boys gave their sister terrible gifts. <laughs> and they're always made me mad, so there was a little bit of a tension about it. But they would spend a lot of money on each other. Whatever money they had, they would buy for each other a nice gift. And then she would get something from the dollar store that nobody knew what it was. <laughs> And she was old enough to know that she'd been slighted. So she, I don't know what they learned from that. But, <laughs> but my point is this. A gift means something. You give a gift. When I give you a gift, it means I see you. I know you. I know what would be something you would need like love. And this symbol, really, that I'm giving you says that. It says... I see this and here it is for you because I love you. And when I give you a gift, what I want my kids to think about, I decided was, I want them to think when they get this gift, wow, Grandpa heard that I was interested in trains and here's this book about trains. This is what this means. Or she knew that I wanted Nikes and my gosh, she went out and spent all that money on them. Or whatever it is, it's not the thing, it's not the money. It is what it says about our relationship. And I wanted them to think about gift giving that way. And I think it's a habit that, that stays through your life about how you create relationships and how you, what you think of relationships. Now, my husband is the world's worst gift giver. He's okay about giving. But you can't give him something he likes. It's impossible. <laughs> so you have Christmas. All these people are grateful about everything. Everybody has killed themselves trying to think, what can we give this guy? And as soon as he opens it, he's disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I can't say that this magical thing that I'm telling you has been created in my house is 100% effective. But for the people who get it, it means something about who they are as people. The last thing that I would say about um, the kinds of habits that you can really work on at home that create, when I say create productivity, I, I don't, they're not productive in the same ways. Homework is productive in one way because the one who embraces it is going to end up way further along than the one who doesn't. Mm -hmm. But gift giving is not productive in that way, but it has to do with this this being productive in our connecting mechanisms, things that show we care, kind of thing, right? The last one that I would talk about would be um, just this sense of you're responsible for your own stuff. It's your stuff. You know? If you, I would, if you can figure out how to record a show on a DVR player, you can run a washing machine. <laughs> If you figure out what to, how to do everything you do on that iPhone, you can do almost anything. I mean, 
mean, what could you not do in a house that that you can do on a, a in your electronics? So that's what I mean by that. My kids wash their clothes from the time that they can reach us. Um, they weren't my clothes. And I, if I did it, I'd be doing it at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. I was doing other things. There was, if, and they had lots of clothes because they were always in sports and dance and all this stuff that required 10 costume changes and dirty clothes all day. So if they wanted clothes the next day, then they needed to wash them. Uh, uh, my mother told me that before I had kids. It, it's brilliant. And why not? Why should I do it? Uh, I knew the sheets, I knew my clothes, I knew my husband's I can do their clothes if I had to, but why should I? It's their stuff. Why should I put stuff away in their room? If they come out in the morning and they say, in, in any, any year along the way, where's my ex? Where's my tennis racket? Where's my homework? Where's my blue shoes? Where's my... I don't know. I can tell you what my stuff is. <laughs> I don't know where your stuff is. Now, I had, I had one who had trouble getting it all together and getting it to the car in the morning, so I orchestrated it for him to do it at night. Because I knew if we waited until morning, it was all hell would break loose. It would just be just, you know, a bad morning. So over time, he didn't go to bed at night until his stuff was in the car. Um, if, if kids pack their own lunches or if you pack them, if you can do it the night before for a kid like that so that it's, yeah, I mean, you can make these things easier for them, but it's you doing it doesn't create the habit for them to do it. Never. It, they will never get it by osmosis. They won't get it because you did. They only get it if they do it. So where, so where's my stuff? I don't know. It's your stuff. And that can actually start very, very, very young. You might have to have a home organized enough that they did get their laundry done, they did get their homework done, that they, the things were accomplished along the way so that it's not, where's my stuff that I didn't do or that I need, it's just how to collect it. So these are habits that I would say lead to productivity, achievement, uh, a happy life, actually. So what you'll do is jot down a few things that are you learned as a child that has led you to productivity. And then in the next column, you would put things that you're doing with your children that are having that effect, or things you wish you were doing that would have that kind of effect. I mean, obviously, you can't go home tonight, and all of a sudden, they're washing their own clothes, and they're making their own beds, and they're, you know, they're listening to you read the paper while they do the dishes, and <laughs>
probably have more to add to that if you're into that section um, later, but let's move on. We talked about values when we did that begin with the end in mind exercise, but I want to come back to that a little bit about how we learn our values and how we pass those, how we pass those on, how we help children absorb them. Um, and I think that the experiences that we have in life kind of set up the ones that are maybe up there at the top. Um, in my house, in, in my life, kindness is very important. I, um, there's this Dalai Lama quote, something like, kindness is, compassion leads to kindness, and, and kindness leads to compassion, and kindness and compassion equal happiness. Uh, I think that kindness embodies so many of other values, uh, and it's such a hard thing to learn. Little kids are very, I think they they are very interested in when we feel sad or when they notice that we're upset or something. But I don't think they quite, they're not quite to that place where they, empathy has begun to fill them in the same way as they begin to get more of a, of a reflective, thoughtful mind about it. But they know when they're being treated kindly. So the other night, my three-year-old grandson and I were, we, we were playing and he was having, he was playing, I was just there, he was having trouble with the truck, and I reached over to fix something that had fallen off, and he looked at me and he said, why are you being so mean? No, <laughs> <laughs> good question, am I mean? I mean, and he was just furious, and it, it was clear that he thought I was stealing his truck, <laughs> or I was grabbing something from him, which I really wasn't doing, but I was so surprised that he even knew what being mean was. I mean, it had never really come up before. I'm, I don't, not usually mean, sometimes I guess it might be, but that wasn't one of them. But it takes a what they know when you're being nice to them. And that should the little tiny ones know when they're being nice to you, but that is starts there, right? The kindness starts there. But kindness is taught just like everything else is taught. And it's not necessarily taught by what I did to one of my children. It's taught more, I think, by when my child sees me being kind to someone else. Right? And, you know, I'm in line at the store and somebody's getting really grouchy and nasty and, you know, whatever. And I am friendly. And then, then you know, the, the question could be, why are you nice to that person? You're being so bad. Because that's how we are. We, we're nice to people. That's what we do. That's the way we, we don't care how they do it. This is how we do it, right? We're, we, we're not going to do that to somebody. That wouldn't be the, the way to treat someone. Um, so the, the kindness or anything else that we say is a value, they learn from watching us with other people. They listen to us when we're talking on the phone. How do you ask when a telemarketer calls? How do you ask when the political calls? How do you act when somebody calls un unhappy with you? For, for in my life, if an angry parent calls me at home and I pick up the phone. What is going on when mom's talking to this person? How, what, what am I listening to here? What's happening here, right? Um, the, what, the values that I would, would think would have come through the most in our house when my kids were growing up, we have very high value on funny things. We like humor. It, it, most situations would be, if we were having a bad situation, it would go away because somebody was funny. That's how that's how it would end up finally being skirted over, resolved, finished up. And if somebody was funny, they were really um, part of the group. And ki my kids always wanted to know, am I funny? <laughs> because Katie never thought anybody laughed at her jokes. Everybody else got laughed at. And she didn't think, I thought I was funny. Am I funny? <laughs> So it was obviously that was something that mattered, right? You wouldn't even comment on it. It would matter to me at my house if people were courageous and if people were strong, because things happen along the way where you had to be. It would matter at my house if people were accepting and respectful. Um, and it would matter at my house if people were taking care of each other. And, and if, if they weren't, I was going to notice them. Would they fight with each other? Yes. Would my husband and I fight? Yes. We all had brains in our heads, and we all had our own minds. 
It's not like, yeah, there's this Pollyanna thing. And it's not like that in anybody's house either. But did we always care about taking care of each other and, and being kind and all these other? Yeah, 100%. Um, I was in a parent meeting one day when, when we were talking about relationships and how important relationships with grandparents and aunts and uncles and all. And this man said, and I had seen this because there was a donut shop close to my house and I saw these people in the donut shop every Saturday morning. He said, my son and I always went to Winchell's with my father and Saturday mornings and had donuts. And how important that was to my son when, when he was growing up. And then he kind of got serious in those eyes and he said, he said, we don't do that anymore. My dad has Alzheimer's and, um, and he doesn't even know who my son is. And um, I said, well, what, do you go see your dad on Saturday mornings? And he said, yes. And I said, does your son go? And he said, no, I don't want him to see my dad that way. I don't want him to know him not knowing him. And so I thought about that for a minute, because that's a, I, I, I said, well, but someday maybe you'll have Alzheimer's. <laughs> and so this is when you're teaching your son that, how we take care of people in these situations, right? And, and, when, and, and your father may not know your son, but he will know if someone's there being kind to him. And your son will know he's there too. He, your son will have the experience of caring for him. So he thought about that, and he did. He came back later and said, "You were right about that. We were doing that." But I think what happens sometimes with us with our kids is we we have these cutoffs where they're not ready for this. You know, they're too young to go to the funeral. They're too young to be around sick people. They're too young to um, to know these harsh realities of life in other ways. And there are some, there are ages when they're too young, but they're but these things about life, if you don't teach them when they're children, they don't know when they leave you. They don't know how what to say to someone who's who's family member die. And, and people around them die all the time, whether it's in their families or not. They don't know how to process bad things that happen in the news. They don't know what to say, what to do, what to think, how to feel. If, if we can't teach them, we can't teach them if we don't confront them. But more importantly, is we want them to be the ones giving us kindness and giving the care, take, taking care of us, to know they can do it. That makes them stronger. So uh, the, the last thing about values that I would say about teaching is the, the uh, motto at our school is probate dignum, prove yourself worthy. Um, it's a very interesting motto, and there are ways to look at that that seem a little harsh almost. But you can emphasize different parts of that phrase and it can mean different things when you do. Prove to yourself that you are worthy is one thing it can mean. I mean, show yourself you can do this. Show yourself you can make a difference. Show yourself you can you can take care of somebody. Show yourself you can handle this work. Show yourself that you can take on this challenge. Or it can mean prove yourself worthy could mean worthy like everybody else is, as a human being, that there's this worth that you have, now do something with it, right? Do something about it. You can take almost any say, especially one as, as old as this. This is actually kind of a stoic uh, anthem uh, from Aristotle and other Greeks and people uh, that, had, that really resonates, I think, in our age, that it continues to have some meaning. So what are those things? in your life? What are the things that you've learned that you've uh, taken as values and um, words that, that regulate who you are as a person? And, have, and you've already talked about in that other page whether you're, how you're going to give these to your kids, but you might jot down here what values you think your kids already have. What one of they, two or three of the ones that they have of this origin and they give out freely on a daily basis. I'm just going to give about four minutes for that one because we work on that sheet.
question is about consequences. about consequences. Consequences that are instructed. So, um, for children, you you end up with a system. Whether you whether you a discipline plan, a way that you do things, a way that you manage to keep them kind of moving along with your high expectations for behavior and all that. Um, for some people, time you, you do time out, or you take something away, or you have a you know uh, an immediate consequence of some kind, or, or even a punishment. But when they get to be a little older, and your challenges are you know, that it's bigger trouble. And it's one thing when they won't go to sleep at night, that seems like it may drive you crazy, but it's not hurting anybody except you. You know, it's, it's not causing pain in the world. It's not dangerous for them and their friends and whether they'll stay alive, that kind of consequence. So when you get to this place where you think about this, you've got kids acting like children who are making decisions about driving, drinking, being a whatever they may be, being with other people, getting themselves in a dangerous situation, those things. But they haven't had a lot of practice at it. So how do you, what kind of consequences are you working on? I think it's best to think about times in your own growing up days, especially days when you were in teenage years, when something happened that could have been a really bad thing and that you, you got a consequence for it. I think whether that was instructive or not. Did you learn from it? Or did it propel you just to be a better sneaker out or liar, you know, <laughs> troublemaker or whatever? If it was instructive, that's the kind of, of memory that you're you're trying to bring forward to use as help with you your own kids. So my my best advice about this is, well, first of all, I'll tell you two things that happened when I was starting up that, that made a difference in my life. My messing up that made a difference. The first one was really a horrible. Next door to me lived a family, and oh, oh, we had kids everywhere in those days. There were lots of kids, period, in the world, but in America. Um, but this one family next door to us, these kids were not part of the pack. They just weren't. They didn't seem to like us, and we definitely didn't like them, and they just were out of step with a whole bunch of other kids. So they had a tent. One, one summer, they put up a tent in their backyard. And every time they would leave the house or go out of town, we would mess with the tent. So we would, you know, just go inside and I don't know what that is. <laughs> we need to, we'll go get it. <laughs> we'll go get it stopped. Um, we would, you know, move things around inside or we would close the flaps or take this. They would just mess with them. By we, I mean the other kids in the neighborhood, including me. Well, one day, um, they pretended to leave, but they were in the house and they were watching to see what was going on, which was 100% what they should have been And my mother had at the house, my dad was a college president, and on that morning there was a, a coffee going on in the house with all the spouses of all the trustees mm -hmm. were there. And then people like the dean's wife and other people from them, all these people who she was trying to impress. Or she was, I don't know if she was trying to, but she was certainly in the spotlight. And I was supposed to be washing the plate in the kitchen. But I happened to notice from the window that these people were gone. So I went right on over and I, I took some steaks out of the tent came right back and I was washing dishes and then Mrs. Buzzard was at the front door. And she, she was Mrs. Buzzard? <laughs> <laughs> that might have been part of the problem. I don't know. <laughs> 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 I can't even imagine what this kid could have made me upset. But she was sobbing. She was yelling. She was, this, where is Bunny? I mean, she was just beside herself. And my mom had answered the door, and then all the people were watching, and she came, mom's little bunny from the kitchen, and she comes storming through the whole place and comes into the kitchen, mom, Sarah, to speak. And I mean, I was hurt. And my mother was very mad at me. But, and it was a terrible, it was a bad thing. 
But the only thing that was really bad was what I had done. I mean, when you really get down to it, Mrs. Buster didn't do it wrong, and my mom sure didn't do it wrong, and I 100% had, and I knew it. I knew it every bit of the way. I knew it. And I should have gotten caught. Well, from then on, my mom made sure that I was David Buzzard's best friend. I mean, he had to go with me everywhere. And if I was going to go have fun, he had to go too. And I, if he didn't want to go, I had to make him want to go. And I had to be in that house all the time telling Mrs. Buzzard how sorry I was and how could I do so. And I said, well, what about all the other kids? You know, it wasn't just me all these weeks. I mean, every kid in this town has been over there messing with that tent. My mother could have cared less about any other kid. You know, I am not a mean person. So the fact that I did that is very Lord of the Fly. You know, it's very much what is in the dark soul of man that causes <laughs> us to act this way to people. But I'm so glad that I got caught. It was such a lesson. I, the lesson should have been doing the act, but that didn't, I didn't get caught in time. The lesson was the pain. The lesson was seeing that woman scream and cry in front of all those people and how upset she was. And my mother saying, how could you have done this to this boy? You know, who, why would you do that? So that was a really good thing in my life. And that, another thing that happened that was a good thing, this had nothing to do with being me. That was enough for me. That was a, uh, that one helped me. But as teenagers, we would sit in the balcony at church, away from our parents who would sit down on the, on the bottom. But up where the minister was in the choir, they could see what was going on in the balcony. But the parents couldn't, right? So we had a, we were in church way more than I would have been in church. And um, we were having this Holy Week thing. So every night there was a sermon and a special man had come in from far away to speak these wonderful sermons. And, uh, on Wednesday night, I was sitting there and I'd taken off my shoes and I was just kind of swimming around and some boy took my shoes and put them up on the railing of the balcony. So there they were. So everybody in the choir and the minister and everybody could see those shoes. And I was trying to figure out, oh my, how am I going to get these shoes back without them knowing that they're my shoes? And every time I kind of reach up, then the kids around me would act like they were going to shove the shoes over. So finally, I thought, oh, God, this is going to end there, the shoes. <laughs> so finally, I reach up like this, and this kid just smacked those shoes, and they went flying, and they <laughs> landed on top of people down below. <laughs> And then, and I really hadn't done anything wrong. You know, I mean, not this really did as a bystander, but they were my shoes. So then, um, <laughs> when you walk down from the balcony, you walk into the entryway where everybody comes from the church. So there was one person with no shoes. <laughs> so, oh, she was so embarrassed. And I tell parents not to be embarrassed by your kids because you didn't do what they did. But she was really embarrassed and just. You know, everybody was talking about that bunny home. <laughs> um, what's wrong with those people? They can't keep their kids in line, and, you know. I had to go to the hotel and meet the minister and just really apologize profusely for interrupting what was really a wonderful worship service <laughs> and how sorry I was to have been so disrespectful. And now, in this case, I wasn't really sorry. I was sorry that it happened, but I didn't really feel like I did anything wrong. So it, it was instructive more in that, you know, things are going to happen in life around you, and you're going to be caught up there, and there you are, the one without the shoes, right? So it helped me in this way. I think there are moments in time when you've got to grab your kid's attention, and it has to be instructive, and it's something like this. It's something where they really are out of line. And you really are disappointed in them. And you want them to know it. And that is just fine. If it doesn't
doesn't happen if we don't do it, who's going to do it? On what day will the police do it? Because we didn't. On what day will somebody get hurt? Because we didn't step in. It has to happen then, when that's so. Think about, all right, how, how do we do this? Think about those things that were instructed to you. Um, okay, so my situation, I have an eight-year-old, and I've, you know, heard about the love and logic, and so when they do something wrong, you know, you give them their consequences, and, you know, she always thinks that it's me being mean, it's my fault, I'm doing this to her, and I always say, no, that's your bad choice, you made the bad choice, this is what happened. She can never take ownership of her behavior, I try to point out to her these are the steps that led us to this consequence and this is, you know, you did this behavior and I told you what was going to happen and that's why it's happening. She still thinks that I'm the bad person and I don't know how to get her to see and to understand. She's right, yeah. She's good. She's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, there are some people who never can admit that they've done them. I mean, that, but but it's also more of a it could be more of a growing process too. She could, you could even be saying, you know, you're so mean, I didn't do anything wrong, and not think it. I mean, it just could be a defensive posture that you're putting out there. It doesn't mean you're not learning the, the lesson necessarily. Um, but some kids are just takes a lot longer than others. They, you know, they're strong willed kids are harder than the compliant kids. I mean. We're all so different from each other, but the but the, the way you're doing this, the right behavior is right. And what I really like about love and logic, the idea of it is just what you're struggling with. The idea of it is we're going to separate this action from you so you can think about it. The logic's supposed to come from you, the child. The love comes from the parents. I love you enough to make note of what's happening here, and I'm taking this now, or I'm having you do this now. And you now can think about this. And when you're ready, uh, with the little ones, you take something away, and if they want it back, then what they have to do is do something to get it back. Right? Uh, so when you're ready, just let me know. And then, and, then, and then if that happens, we'll try again. But we want you to think. And so what, what's going on now with our three-year-old, uh, with the three-year-old grandson, is they're using the word, um, did you listen to you know, I've already told you this. Did you listen to me? As soon as he hears the word listen, then he'll stand there and then he'll decide if he wants to go ahead and be bad, be naughty and do it, if it's worth it to him, or if he will stop. So that's exactly what the idea is, but but not everybody gets there. And you know, they make it sound so easy. Like, yeah. this is what you do. You say, oh, bummer, I'm sorry you made that bad choice. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Some of us are, are unlucky enough to have children who punish us more than we punish them. Yes. <laughs> but you have, you've got to stay the course. I have a No need to stress. This is what's going to happen. We speak not. We just do. I, I screwed up by because I was taking my uh, well, <coughs> at the time of my dad. So that, you know what? How I learned this one. So hey, you got to bark back. And that's what my dad did. Bark right. back. And um, you know I learned to put the jet away from that. And uh, that's helpful. It's to know that what works, what your parents did to you. We, we tend to, um, from the get-go, either emulate what happened to us just because that's all we know, or do the opposite because we didn't think it worked or we hated it or felt disrespected by it. 
but what but what really works is more of a thought process that aims us over in that far right top fourth quadrant. And that's where the, the, what's wrong with the barking is that pretty soon they are responding with anger to the anger instead of stopping the behavior and thinking about the behavior. So that when, you, when you come at it that way, it, it ultimately it is the right way to tweak. You might try to tweak it, but ultimately it's the right way. Okay, um, I'm just going to give two minutes to jot anything down that's in your head that you have on that, and then we'll move on. The next one is, is uh, we won't spend much time on because it's um, probably not as important as the last two, and I don't want to run out of time for those. But um, embracing challenges that stretch for our kids that stretch them, I really think that that one's big, especially if we're looking with high standards for and expectations for behaviors and for learning and all that. Um, if a kid has a chance to move up in math, or if they want to sell the most Girl Scout cookies, or if uh, they want to try to do this river trip where they're going to kayak 20 miles down the river with, the, with some people who are old enough to take them. The, the ability to see a challenge as a challenge as a parent, to see, you know, this would really be a growing experience. This is hard. You know, this is the setting the goal out there and going for it. This is a good thing. Some of us are more careful than that. We haven't gone after the big challenges in our own lives, so we don't really sense personally in our bones why that is such a good thing. But it is a good thing, because that's how we grow our own confidence and competence, is by meeting those challenges and having some. So, you know, maybe it is uh, reading 100 books in the, book, uh, in, the, in the book club in middle school. You know, there are kids who would just die if they can't read the most. Uh, what's wrong with that? They're reading all those books. How, nothing's wrong with that, right? There are the kids who could care less. That's not the thing. But uh, getting your personal best in track or whatever it is, if it's a stretch, they're going to grow. That reminds me. If it's a stretch, they're going to grow. Here's where you want them. And it doesn't matter what the activity is. I don't know if you guys can see this. There is a magic spot between those two. Uh, it's the spot where I have confidence enough because I know some things, and I have excitement enough because I don't have a clue. Right? So I don't want to get up in this area. That's going to be hard and overwhelming. And I don't have enough to hang on to to, to grasp it. And I definitely don't want to live that. Here's where people who come to collegiate often have been where I'm bored to death because it's so easy. What I want to be is in a state of flow, which is the right here, one foot back here where it was known and done and got it, and one foot aiming 
over here where I don't have a clue. And somewhere right in the middle is that thing that sparks my excitement, but I have to really, really work at it. This is why you want, a, you want to find challenges, is because we want to keep them here in the way of thinking that propels us forward more than any other kind. This can be in sports, it can be in anything. It can be in any activity. It can be in calculus. I mean, it can be anywhere, but it, the trick is that it's a particular distance between both. And once it gets easy and you've done it, then you gotta change the angle a bit to get there. The things that we do that give us the most satisfaction, intellectually especially, but this is true physically, I think, too, are the things that keep us in that state of flow. I took a group of kids to um, carry to this, um, in the education department, there's a woman who does research on creativity. <coughs> and she talked to them about what is, she asked them, there were 13 of us there, she asked them, when did, what are you doing at that moment when you completely lose track of time, you don't, you're not aware of anybody around you, and you're completely absorbed in the moment? And when she asked the question, I thought, I don't think they'll be able to answer this. I mean, I knew who I was with. I, I wouldn't, every one of them, they went around, every one of them, just like that. One of them, it was when he was just about to swing, to take the backstroke and swing in the golf course. And he said, I could be there for a minute, uh, uh, 10 seconds or 10 minutes, I, I couldn't even tell you. One of them, it was when he's working on his calculus problems at night. He said, it's almost like I go to heaven when I've got a really hard problem. And he says, I can look up later and see the clock and think, is that really what time it is? I mean, they all had, they all knew. These were high school juniors and seniors. They all knew when they were in this state of flow. So if we're wondering about what challenges to present, we may not even have, we may just ask them what challenges are they meeting? What challenges are they engaged in? But for the younger children, I would say, is to make sure that they have some. There's, there's sitting around stuff, there's sitting around looking at phones, or sitting around watching TV, or just sitting around being sad, doesn't get us to any of these places. All right, it takes other things to do that. So do, do you uh, have some ideas about how to think about that? And that clears my memory. Clears <laughs> my Okay, let's talk. Routines and traditions. We really have talked about this one some. Um, it's, and I, you know, I think family life should be built around it, just like I think classroom life should be built around it. They're very, very important. It's, traditions are really important. We talk a lot about the new and the challenging and the different and all that, but they come on this bedrock of the things that matter to us that we expect and that we love to see time after time after. Um, and then, uh, so I think, because we talked about habits in the way that I did, that that kind of overlaps here. Why don't you just write down what you would say are the four traditions you have in your family, in your home, that you think everybody in your home would agree these are the most important four traditions. And then on the child side, put down if you think something's lacking or if you think that there is, you know, kids would say we don't have tradition.
say about that. You, you wrote quite a bit. I went to boarding school for high school. I was an international boarding school, so people from different languages, backgrounds, and they had a lot of ritual. The, we would go on certain trips, the juniors would go here, the seniors would go here, and then the seniors would the juniors. It was very ritualistic a lot of times, and I remember finding it kind of, since when I became a senior, a little fatiguing. We're gonna do Zoom call again. <laughs> they live with you all. And one of the teachers was like, well, one of the reasons we're so ingrained in our rituals to create a sense of family, because you guys, we are your family. You know, you, you live here. You moved out away from home when you were 14. So you came pretty green with your culture and your religious perspectives and all that. So we had to develop this strong sense of ritualism to uh, make you feel like you have a family and connectedness connectivity where he sends you off to another family, you know, and I remember thinking about, I'm like, okay, so I can do this ritual one more time. <laughs> and then you were glad to let it go? But it was, it, yeah, I still, I brought some of them to my family as well. That's so give me an example of that one, what would be one that you brought to your family? ODA. So the, with the old, my last name is Dara. So whenever there's a crisis or an emergency or a decision that has to be made, ODA makes the decision, oldest DARA available. So for whatever, <laughs> with whatever dorm we were with, the OBA or the OCA or the O, whoever, the oldest one available makes the final call. And so when I'm leaving the house, I'm like, okay, Genevieve's ODA or so-and-so's ODA, and that's what we I love that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's look at the last one, the responsibility. So responsibility is a key word for creating adult life skills, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about chores, but chores are the only responsibilities that we have at home, right? We have responsibilities for ourselves, we have responsibilities for our stuff, we have responsibility for each other, we have responsibility for, what, for, for our chores, you know, we have all kinds of responsibilities. Um, we have responsibilities in the neighborhood. I, I really do think that one of our biggest, one of the legs of the stools that fell off was neighborhood. Church is one, is a, is a leg that fell off for some group of the culture, but for sure neighborhood was a, a bigger leg that fell off. Um, because we just start all taking care of each other. We just don't all know each other. We just don't all... We don't even feel comfortable talking to each other about, you know, your dog's barking and, you know, whatever else is going on. It's a little, we're not sure it might not make them mad and then they might do something to us. And that it's not a, it's not like a neighborhood. Well, we tried to do it with our kids and, and uh, it's the only way that we know any of our neighbors at all is we, we tried to make them do things for neighbors. You know, if the old lady down the street got the paper but it was always thrown in the yard, They'd run over and put it up on the porch before we got the car. Or, you know, the sick, the sick lady that Katie had to take flowers to. Or um, we just wanted to be on the lookout all the time for inobtrusive ways that we could help or be a part of things. Um, we don't have a neighborhood where my kids grew up where there's a lot of kids running around. It's, it never has been that way. But we do know the adults now only because our kids did things for we did have this one person who lived next to us for a while who was on the other side, not very friendly. And my daughter sold Girl Scout cookies like it was some kind of a business. And, um, <laughs> and she was the leading Girl Scout cookie salesman in Kansas for three years. Um, one year she sold 1,700 boxes. Oh my gosh. But the, not, the guy next door would never buy one. So, um, so one year, Kate News was gonna follow her around <laughs> and see how she, you know, sold all these boxes of cookies. And so she went first to his house. So the news camera is there with her, and she knocks on the door, and she says, you know, I just wanted to buy some Girl Scout cookies. And he starts to say no, and then he sees the TV camera. <laughs> 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 it's a straight big smile. He's like, well, sure, Kate, I'd be happy to buy a box of Girl Scout So anyway, but, but the neighborhood is... Um, one avenue where you can teach responsibility. It's people that you can say, reach out, reach out, reach out, go do this, help, help, help. 
help these people. Um, school is definitely one. And not just the responsibilities of getting my homework done and getting to practice on time and do it following the rules and that kind of thing, but, but you, there's trash on the ground. Should I pick it up? You know, there's something broken. Should I tell someone? There's a, a so-and-so is having a problem. Should I help? Should I tell someone she's having a problem? Um, that often happens, when, especially if it's a problem either between a child and a teacher or a child and another, ch another child. The kids may talk about it amongst themselves and even may be at home with their parents, but that doesn't mean that they've gotten involved in it. And so if you hear about that, it's a good chance to say, what did you do? What did you do? You know, this was happening with, between Sally and Sue. What did you do? And so that they begin thinking about this whole responsibility they have for other people. What did they do? You know, how, how we, and not, this is what you should do. This is what did you do? What should you do tomorrow? Um, obviously, there are other places where they can have specific responsibility. That is important. And again, it comes from modeling. I came to work one day, um, and my office was over by the quad in, the, in, in between lower and middle and early childhood. When I walked through the quad, somebody had been in there at night and had stuck plastic forks, thousands of them, in the grass everywhere. And so as I walked through, I thought, <laughs> OK, I'll get these when I'm leaving. But I, was, I worked for a few hours, and as I came back out, almost all of them were gone, and I looked around, and there was the whole Newland family, Sherry Newland taught here, and the kids all went to. All five of them were out there just grabbing those forks and throwing them away, and, and I thought, you know, it's really no wonder these are such nice kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the kind of way their, their family walks through life, is what should we be doing here in this situation now? We, we're willing to take this responsibility, this sort of this community responsibility for what's happening. Uh, so, you take a minute and jot down if any, if, if you ever, if you had a sort of a flash, a flashing moment of something you don't want to forget there. These responsibilities, you know, I talked about filling the reservoir, these responsibilities to the rest of the world around you. These are soul building. These are, and, and they build your own esteem as this is happening because it has to do with your relationship to the world and your place in it. 